Hello. Wow, I'm so happy to see so many of you here. So first of all, who knows who this person is? The, 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 uh, who can tell me? Oh, this doesn't work, I guess. No, Clint Eastwood. <laughs> So, so for those of you who are not from U.S., so in the 60s, there was a movie called The Good and Bad and Ugly, starring Clint Eastwood. It was a very popular movie. And then after, after that, um, people start using the phrase the good and bad and ugly to describe the truth of a specific subject. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the truth of how um, Telco's experiences using OpenStack. And um, my name is Annie Lai. I'm with Huawei IT Product Line. And I've been with Huawei for almost four years. Um, for the last three, four years, I've traveled to uh, over 30 countries talking to telcos about their cloud initiatives, especially uh, OpenStack. And today, I'd like to share you um, the learnings and the findings I, I got from working with them on their um, cloud initiatives and their OpenStack initiatives. And I just want to let you know, it's an overview kind of presentation. So it's more about you know, how telcos use OpenStack. If you're looking for more technical details, we definitely have a lot of uh, you know, experts. We have architects. We have senior engineers here. We can talk to you more about technical details later. But due to the limited amount of time, we can only talk about very high level. So, um, so first of all, for those of you who are not very familiar with Telco, just very quickly, I want to talk about Telco current situation. Um, telcos are going through a very interesting time, and because their competitive landscape is changing, they are no longer competing against other telcos. They are also competing against OTT guys. And even though there's more and more traffic, more subscribers, more users, but their margin is shrinking. <laughs> And they have to find a way to change that. And um, they also found out that their OPEX, um, did I? Oh. Their OPEX is increasing, and which means now that very efficient. So they need to improve their OPEX. And also, they need to improve the way they innovate, they develop, they deploy services. And as you heard this morning, you know, from um, morning's keynotes, um, OTGs can deploy their services pretty quickly. And telcos takes months, sometimes um, close to a year, to deploy, to develop and deploy a new service. So they, with that kind of development processes, they cannot compete. So they have to innovate, not just their IT networks, but also the way they develop and deploy services. So cloud computing presents great opportunities to them, because with cloud computing, virtualization, abstraction, they can transform their IT, their networks, and with automation and orchestration, they can um, simplify their operations and cut down their cost. And also with the software-defined paradigm, they can um, innovate a lot faster and deploy a lot faster. And so I'm going to use uh, three telco stories. And unfortunately, I can't give you their names because I need to protect the confidentiality of their projects. And, but as uh, Huawei, as a uh, telco's partner, and it's our duty, and also we're an OpenStack Gold member, it, it is our duty to, um, over time, welcome all these telco, our telco customers to come and you know, join us in the OpenStack community. And hopefully, next year, we're going to hear a lot, a lot of uh, super users from our telco um, friends, and they can talk about their stories themselves. But today, I'm just going to be very general, and I'll give you enough description. You probably can guess who they are. <laughs> So first, Telco is actually a hybrid cloud case. And so this is a MIA-based multinational Telco with over 400 million subscribers. And they have a lot of a huge partner network running over 65 countries. And um, as you know, they are tier one Telco. They need to innovate. They need to compete. So a lot of their line of business, they can't wait for their ITs to get their act together. So there's this shadow IT, right? They use Amazon. And ITs would try to learn about cloud computing by um, implementing VMware. But this is the time that they realize that, OK, the shadow IT is happening. And they are actually spending at least $2 million on Amazon. And they figure this is the time they have to come up with an open cloud platform that incorporates uh, what they have existing, which is VMware, as well as Amazon, and create this unified open cloud platform for their own internal innovation. And also, this cloud platform needs to work across multiple data centers. As you know, telcos, they have a lot of uh, subnets, a lot of partners they work with, and they want to standardize this open cloud um, platform so all the subnets and partners can uh, leverage this open platform to innovate together. 
And um, so this is their vision. This is a project. So um, from basically, they need this open cloud platform that's multi-tenant with uh, one unified portal, one service catalog, and one service management. And but it has to run across multiple data centers. And the cloud platform has to be highly secure, highly reliable. And also, they need to plan for future growth, especially for storage. Uh, as you all know that we are growing data in an exponential way, and they need to have a hybrid storage um, strategy to grow their storage for this uh, hybrid cloud. And also, um, from a user standpoint, they want to be able to use any kind of public cloud or a private cloud, but um, they, want, they do want to have this um, a consistent way, a single pane of glass of administration and usage of their cloud services. And this is the architecture that Huawei, we propose to them. So basically, we are leveraging OpenStack um, cloud platform. And this is going to be a multi-region, multi-availability uh, zone based architecture. Runs, and we need to plan for future growth. So we need to plan for a large uh, growth. And we're talking about 100 um, availability zones and more than 100,000 physical servers. And then on top, we want to have a unified pass that it, all the developers can leverage. But however, if they want to still want to go to Amazon and stuff, they can still do so. But um, the goal is internally, they want to have a very mature pass. And uh, the portal has to be fully distributed. In other words, each data center needs to have their own portal, but they do have this single pane of glass view. And um, so it needs to be Amazon AWS-like kind of experience. And underneath, it has to be a heterogeneous environment. In other words, the CTOs wanted to, be, to have vendor choices. They, they don't want to have vendor login. And this is Huawei's solution. So Huawei Fusion Sphere is uh, OpenStack distro. Um, in the middle of this year, we just passed the interoperability certification. So we got the OpenStack powered uh, logo surf, uh, license. And um, so we are very proud of that. And um, so with this solution, the uh, Telco A can connect with VMware as well as Amazon. And in the future, they like to connect with um, Azure as well. And um, so the, the existing OpenStack that we got from the community does not fully meet the requirements. So we actually had to in add an extension to incorporate you know, more availability, more performance, more reliability. And on top of that, because Telco A's requirements to run this um, cloud in a distributed data center environment, so we need to add this cascading OpenStack capability. And there's currently a project within the OpenStack community called TriCircle. And uh, today, I have our lead engineer, who is also a core member of TriCircle, Huang Zhipong. He will come out and talk to you more details about what this cascading OpenStack is about and the current status of TriCircle. Can you hear? Maybe I should just stand next to you. <laughs> Is this turned on? It, it should be on now. Okay, hello. Okay. This is a nice crowd. Uh, I'm Howard Huang. So uh, I'm currently the uh, core contributor of the TriCircle project and also uh, OPMV multi-site uh, DPACC and PTL of the uh, OPMV parser project. So uh, today uh, I, I will share with you guys uh, how we open sourcing the uh, cascading solution to the open source community. So uh, first of all, just show of hands, how many of you guys went to yesterday's multi-site OpenStack deep dive session. Okay, I guess many of you just can't get in the room. You know, this is so crowded. Um, so, uh, first of all, a overview of cascading OpenStack uh, solutions. So basically, we want to enable users to use uh, one OpenStack instances to manage multiple OpenStack instances that is distributed across multiple data centers, okay? Um, so uh, in, in this way, it enables you to have a unified management uh, plan. The benefit of this uh, method is 
uh, is that you could uh, just, uh, for example, you could automate, uh, you could do automation of the uh, network uh, creation uh, ac just across multiple sites uh, using cascading. Okay, you, you, you don't have to, you know, manually connect side by side, side by side. Uh, I think another benefit is that when you use a uh, cascading solution combined with, for example, uh, OpenStack Magnum, and if you are familiar with Kubernetes, uh, they are now proposing a, uh, also a federation solution called Ubernetis. I think uh, with OpenStack Magnum, you could actually just combine uh, cascading and with Ubernetis to give you a, uh, a really great uh, multi-site federation uh, solution, okay? So we, uh, so let me introduce uh, some of the uh, history. I think we introduced the whole concept of cascading OpenStack uh, in Paris Summit. Uh, that's uh, October last year, I think. Um, and then in earlier this year, we uh, we did the POC uh, to to see uh, how uh, how. Uh, how many VMs, uh, what's the scalability uh, of cascading solution could support? And the POC shows that we could uh, support the uh, scalability up to, like you see in the slide, uh, millions of VMs. That's uh, really uh, amazing. And, and uh, in, uh, I think, around June or July this year, uh, we put our uh, cascading core architecture and and uh, contributed to to the OpenStack community, which is called the TriCircle project. And uh, we also, uh, from our cascading practice, we also uh, contribute some ideas to the requirement project in OpenV multi-site project. So. Uh, I think you could uh, you could say that uh, the open source cascading solution is uh, consists of the OpenStack TriCircle, which is the backbone, the the, the architecture, and the OPMV multi-site, which is the feature enhancement on the existing OpenStack components like Nova, Cinder, Neutron. Okay. Um, okay, I I. I actually updated <laughs> this slide, but okay. So uh, I think you could search on on, on Google. Uh, we have a wiki page about the TriCircle uh, architecture. I, actually, I think this is one uh, Ayo and Pino uh, showed yesterday. This is a a experimental uh, architecture. So the basic architecture we use in the uh, POC would be to have a, a single standalone, uh, what do you call, uh, tricircle service that serves as proxies uh, that uh, that talks with the the top uh, OpenStack instance, uh, the one you 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 manage uh, multiple OpenStack instances through. Uh, so uh, the tricircle service. Uh, talks uh, via RPC to, uh, with the top OpenStack instance, and then, uh, and then the top, in, uh, top OpenStack instance uh, use TriCircle services to, uh, to manage all the, what we call the logically bottom uh, OpenStack distributed instances. Now, uh, the figure here is a, uh, still a, uh, I think, experimental, you could call it. Uh, we are still trying to uh, modify and have more discussion about uh, how the architecture would evolve, uh, but the, the the core concept would remain the same. That with TriCircle, we provide an uh, you you could call extension as a service. So we provide a stand a standalone service that when you use TriCircle, you could. Uh, deploy your multiple OpenStack instances across multiple sites in a cascading way. 
Okay. Uh, okay, that's. Uh, sorry for I misunderstand. John okay. John Wayne is. John Wayne is back. No, it's not. It's Clean Eastwood. I have to keep saying it's Clean Eastwood. It's not John Wayne. Okay, so in summary, we know that OpenStack actually offers a very good open cloud platform for telcos to deploy their IT and innovate um, services. And however, telco, the nature of telco is multi data centers. So the project TriCircle is very important to meet telco's requirements. And we hope that project will move faster and then, so, and then upstream to the community so uh, telcos can fully take advantage of that. However, um, in order for telco to fully deploy IT as a service, there needs to be a lot more um, automation that needs to be done and also um, in the hybrid cloud area that the data and applications need to be able to move between public cloud and private cloud smoothly back and forth. And th those are the areas that still need a lot more um, development. And um, so hopefully we can uh, see more maturity in those areas. So the next uh, story is the is a public cloud use case. And um, so, you know, a lot of uh, people in U.S. think that, oh, telcos run public cloud is very challenging, right? But in U.S., US you know, I totally agree because you have the Amazon, you have the Microsoft, and you have Google. It's really hard to compete. So the U.S. telcos have a very tough time. But outside of U.S., actually, telcos have a great opportunity running as a public cloud service provider. And it's because um, the regions that, you know, I have been to, like um, Africa, EMEA, and Latin America, Asia PAC, uh, a lot of telcos, they're considered to be technology um, authority. They have the government backing. They, um, and also because of data sovereignty issues, a lot of U.S. You know, OTT guys can't get into their market as easily. So um, they actually have a great opportunities. And uh, it is actually a very hot topic, um, telco enable public cloud, um, when I travel to uh, those regions. And telcos like to differentiate themselves from the OTT guys. So try to call themselves telco cloud <laughs> instead of you know, public cloud, because they want to say we are more, we can offer more you know, um, SLA, that kind of stuff. And um, so um, later you'll see this is the area that we need to you know, continue developing. This remote is not very swift. <laughs> okay, so this data is from Gartner. As you can see, emerging Asia PAC, Great China, Latin America, you know, and Africa. Uh, Africa. These agents actually regions are, uh, you know, uh, high growth regions for public cloud. And um, so for those uh, telcos in those regions, they actually have a great opportunities. And um, it's because, you know, first of all, they don't, um, besides all those reasons I mentioned, they don't have um, the baggage of existing you know, IT infrastructure. So for them, moving to the cloud is very, it's a lot easier. And SMEs pretty much don't own IT. And then um, enterprises, they definitely see the advantage of you know, um, using a public cloud. So, uh, so public cloud is actually a very good opportunity for telcos in those regions. And telcos are investing in telco cloud pretty heavily. And these are the reasons, because of data sovereignty issue, and also they are already sell selling CT services, selling IT, cloud IT services, is just another, um, you know, um, it's a very easier upsell. And then they can say we are telco grade, and comparing to um, the existing OTT guys, they offer more SLA. And um, the key to success is they need to properly position and then also package their services. And um, so Telco is actually investing a lot. We're seeing, you know, this data actually comes from Informa, Telcom, and Media. Actually, we, we're seeing hundreds and hundreds of Telcos are at least offering one cloud service. And Telcos generally, they specifically build data centers just to run their cloud service, public cloud. And so we see a lot of data center kind of projects, which is about building public cloud. And but, however, Telcos, um, they are, um, they are, in, they are not as experienced as IT vendors in the sense that they don't know how to build up this ecosystem. And because, you know, public cloud is pretty much driven by ITs. So that's something they need to understand and go to market how to sell cloud services, how to service cloud services. So this is where vendors can come in and help. And um, so who's making money? This is a million dollar question. Um, so 
you know, actually they are published information that some of the telcos um, outside of U.S. are actually making money. Like, you know, earlier today um, you heard um, some, uh, you know, some of the telcos and then also you have NTT, China Telecom, and, you know, uh, Deutsche Telekom and all these telcos, they are actually having, they actually have a certain amount of success. And uh, the catch is a lot of telcos, they expect to make money right away on day one, which is impossible because for any kind of public cloud service, they need to go through this, you know, subscriber acquisition and all that and then get through certain maturity of their cloud services. And then, you know, they can start um, getting revenue. So, uh, so what we are seeing is um, all these first tier telcos are, have been deploying some sort of public cloud already using VMware. Now they are going through second wave of um, public cloud uh, architecture and it use it, um, using OpenStack. And so uh, having this conversation is very easy because they know that in order to compete against, you know, Amazon, these guys, they need to find a way to increase their margin. And that means they want to have options in choosing different kind of hardware they want or hypervisors. And then they can tier the services based on, um, you know, with, with the open architecture, they can tier the services a lot faster. So we're seeing the second generation, you know, public cloud telco happening. And um, business case is this uh, one telco in Asia Pac, and over uh, this particular telco, they are uh, more than 51% owned by the government. So, like I said, having a government backing, they have a lot more advantage being the de facto public cloud service provider for their region. And again, this is uh, you know a large telco with two over two million broadband access users. And they have deployed um, a public cloud already using VCE um, two years ago. And um, back then, they, were, they can over, uh, only reach to 99% SLA. And uh, so now, they're building the second generation public cloud using um, OpenStack, hoping that uh, with OpenStack, they can um, increase their margin, decrease their cost, and also they can achieve more um, differentiators. And this is the solution that we offer them and is using Huawei Fusion Sphere and um, as a cloud platform. For public cloud, generally technology is not the tough part, it's the business model, is the go-to market. And so with Fusion Sphere, which is OpenStack based, they have interoperability, they have options in hardware and hypervisors and containers. But um, the complicated area that needs a lot more development is the service portal, service catalog, how you onboard a service, how you, you know, automate this whole service um, um, ordering process, do billing, and the billing has to be connected with Telco's, you know, BSS, OSS system, which is very complex. So the area on top, as you can see, that's where most of the professional services come in and they need to work on those developments, but the cloud platform is pretty straightforward to them. So um, here, this is how we, Huawei, we help this telco win. Um, instead of, they originally they can only achieve two nines, we help them uh, get to three nines, so they can say the, their differentiator competing against Amazon is, you know, they can offer it more SLA. And they actually have a goal of migrating 300 SMEs from Amazon to their cloud, to their telco cloud. And um, they also um, decrease their cost, so that means they increase their margin. And, um, but when they build their public cloud, one requirement is they want to make sure that the user experience is the same as AWS. So their customers can, can they can mi easily migrate their customers from AWS to their public cloud. And also, um, they need to offer regionalized uh, services. You know, a lot of um, services in US do not, might not apply in their region in terms of pricing, in terms of capabilities. So it's very key for them to develop their regionalized um, services and building up that ecosystem could be very challenging to them, but it's a must for them to differentiate. And so in summary, um, again, you know, when telcos got great opportunities and then OpenStack give them the um, the capability to use different kinds of hardware so they can offer different tierings. In that case, they can monetize better, they can have more margin. And however, what's lacking OpenStack is, you know, telco grade. Uh, Huawei, we had to add a lot more performance, um, reliability, availability to help telco differentiate. And also building this partner ecosystem and um, right now pretty much is um, very limited. And in order for telcos to offer a lot more regionalized um, services, they need to work with vendors to help them build up this ecosystem. But I have seen success stories. They have like apps specifically for 
you know, law, law firms for dental offices and stuff like that. And they, the regional, you know, businesses can fully utilize. And once that takes off, then the public cloud will be a lot more, get, will get a lot more adoption. Okay, the third use case is NIV. You heard a lot about NIV this morning from today's keynotes, and NIV is very hot. Uh, however, it is at the very early days of, um, you know, OpenStack adoption. And um, so I don't want to repeat too much, but everybody knows the benefit of NIV with virtualization. Telcos can transform the way they develop and deploy network services, and they can cut down their OPEX and CAPEX and increase um, their innovation in delivering telco services. Instead of using silo proprietary hardware, now you know the services can be virtualized so they can deploy a lot faster with a lot more efficiency. And this ter particular telco is an EMEA-based um, telco uh, um, broadband and communication providers. They actually run business um, pretty much globally everywhere, Europe, Asia, North America, and South America. And um, this is one of the largest telcos in the world, and they really need to innovate their network services and you know NFV, they're looking at NFV and OpenStack and hopefully they can reach their more you know uh, network service uh, innovations. And so I just want to show this one uh, slide to show you that this is the current data center is a mess. They have more than 90 data centers, they have more than 50,000 servers, more than 1,000 applications, more than 20, you know, OSs, lots of capex, opex, and time to market is very slow. This is a very classic, typical first-tier telcos environment. And for them, in order to move from this environment to a highly centralized, highly, you know, cloud-based um, kind of environment, they go through this um, NFV process. And today, I have our um, architect for mobile. Uh, Pakash, who is gonna, who is very intimately involved in NFV development at Huawei, and he's gonna come out and talk to you about, you know, how Huawei helped this particular customer. Hello, thank you, Annie, and thank you, audience. So, first thing uh, I want to go with is, what do we do? In NFV, okay. Hopefully, the point over there. <laughs> okay, here. Yeah. No, this is the one. Hold down. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Okay. So, let me bring you to the open platform for NFV. Of course, every vendor wants to make money. No qualms about it. But at the same time, you need to have some standards so that one can build on it. So we started our journey way back when uh, 2013, when we joined OpenStack as a gold member. And we did some proof of concepts, et cetera, internally before we came to OpenStack and looked at what do we do. And then we realized that OpenStack has great things, but at the same time, it lacks a lot of things, and especially Neutron was really messy. It has evolved over a period, essentially over the last couple of years, start, starting from uh, Folsom to Grizzly to Havana to Ice House, Juno to uh, Kilo, and finally we are there at Liberty at this time, and it has definitely stabilized a lot. As you saw in the morning, the percentage has grown uh, quite a bit, up to 90, 89, 90% now. People use it for production. Still, uh, that doesn't still do the carrier grade uh, requirements that are uh, requested by telcos like AT&T, CMC, CMCC, and uh, various uh, telcos. So put it this way, we went through the open platform for NFE around last September, and then by January we were able to pull together some kind of a requirement uh, there are currently in Op NFE open platform for NFE around 38 projects in that group, out of which only four were really released in the first phase called Arno, and that was just to set up the uh, OpenStack plus ODL. So the issue is when you look at the HC reference, you have got three tier, the VIM, the VNF manager, and the NFE orchestrator. On, on the left side, you will find all of the whatever. Uh, platform, that is NFEI POPs, what we call. 
to get those pops you need to have first a mechanism and that was the first target so we decided to go with arno in that first release what we did was we took OpenStack plus ODL, of course, it's not me, it's the whole industry. Uh, we have all the competitors, everybody came together with the service provider providing the requirement and we clubbed together the OpenStack plus ODL. At that time, there was only SDN controller which was really available. And then, by combining them, we focused on the continuous integration under Octopus project, what we call then, and that provided the first release somewhere uh, in the June time frame. It slipped by some time, but you do expect the growing pain. But later on now, uh, we decided that it should go into second release. So Arno next was followed by Brahmaputra. And in that, we decided to have some of the key features because for anybody to use, if you have multiple sites, site to site VPN, L3 VPN, those are the key telco requirements. Today also we had a bird of feather and then we discussed with the Verizon and at and We found that there is a, uh, what you call, uh, L3VPN requirement. So we integrated ODL, ONOS and Open Control and that's the goal in the B release. In the C release we are looking at dynamic service chaining and VNF forwarding graph. And going forward we are also looking at supporting the 4.5 5G which requires the IoT and uh, MTC, which is uh, mass, you got massive number of people, and, and that's the way we are going. So next, I have here, what did we do in open source? That is one thing. What do we do inside? Inside, we are trying to provide products that meets the telco challenges. So we have some of the challenges which went through. We started with cloud OS, and then uh, that's the one which is the more virtualization part, the Vim part, the OpenStack part of it. And then at the top we have the VNFs, which are VEPC, VMSC and applications. So this is what it is. I'll go to the next slide, which actually shows the gut of it. And the gut of it is this, that you need to have something at the bottom, which is our Fusion Sphere product line. And then we added to that the product lines, which include Fusion Sphere is one, VEPC, that is the packet core, which is virtual packet core, VIMS, which is the uh, GI LAN side of it, which is the mobility part of it, where we need to provide services. VMSC is the multi-service engine. Then value-add services we have to provide on top of VMSC platform. So we have from radio to the core to the, uh, what do you call the GI LAN, or the service side. On the radio side, of course, we have the cloud edge, which is the edge services. So these are the product lines which we have web, uh, put together and then uh, that's what we have given as uh, products to the industry. And the whole, uh, in this the only thing which carry the message is that we did try a lot of stuff but we found that Ono's uh, SA, SDN controller being key for our product line. And so we are focused on Ono's even though we started with ODL and we do support both of them. We are agnostic, however our product line, we want to go with the owners and that's the key message in this. I think uh, this is uh, what I have and I think I'll hand over to Amy. Thank, thank you, Prakash. So, so we know in, uh, in summary that, you know, telcos definitely see the benefit of OpenStack for their NVV project. However, the biggest challenge is, you know, telcos come from, um, a world of standards, right? So you have the, <laughs> this is not going, you know, I'm just, huh? This is not forwarding. Hold on, I'm so sorry. Is it? Escape. Okay. Good. Okay, I got some technical guys helping me out. So the biggest challenge is telcos come from the world of standards, right? And there's Ono's Open MV and you know Etsy standards. All of these standards, they all have something to do with uh, NFV. And then OpenStack, obviously, we have something to do with NFV. The key thing is to have all of them aligned so we're all moving towards the same direction. And this is where, as a body, um, 
together, OpenStack community, we can you know, work together with uh, the open standards um, out there, and, um, and so we can mush, uh, push this NFV um, progress forward. And um, so in summary, I just want to say, you know, doesn't matter whether it's a hybrid cloud, private cloud, public cloud, telco cloud, or NFV. And telcos definitely see the benefit of uh, OpenStack. They came from VMware world, Amazon world, now they see. And they really, the CIOs really believe the promise of interoperability. They do understand that OpenStack might not be telco ready today, but the fact that the interoperability is gonna allow them to have vendor choices, they don't have vendor login, and then also there's a community innovation, it's worth it enough for them to try OpenStack today. So as a community, let's all work together to move the telco, to move OpenStack maturity um, forward so we can make OpenStack truly telco ready. Okay, with that, um, do I have time for questions? I'll be happy to answer a couple questions, and I think and that will be it. Here. Microphone, okay, can somebody? Pass the microphone to him. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, so your first use case was about a, a carrier looking at uh, internal IT transformation, mm -hmm. right? Yes. The second was uh, a carrier looking at becoming, using OpenStack as a public, public cloud. Platform. Are any of them thinking about Using one? Well, possibly leveraging both, because yeah, otherwise... it's a very good question, even NFV, too. So from technology standpoint, it's totally possible. In fact, that's what Huawei we offered. You know, we have this reference architecture called SDDC Square Cloud Distributed uh, Architecture. However, from a political standpoint, it's really tough because generally NFV is driven by network leaders, and then you have um, you know private clouds. It's generally that project is led by IT, and then the public cloud is led by the enterprise group or CMOs. So a lot of times that you know they want to have a control of the platform. They all want to become the cloud uh, owner for the company for the telco. So a lot of times when we work with them, we need to, we generally talk to all of them and then bring them together. So from a technology standpoint, it's definitely doable there. You know, you can specify VDC according to your requirements. And, but um, it's the processes generally they are lacking. But it's a very good question, but I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, five years down the road, there'll be one big cloud platform that services all the business units within Telco. Okay, any other question? Yes, um, microphone, please. All right, hey, thanks for the presentation, appreciate that. Uh, on your third use case, um, is it my understanding correct that's gonna be a brownfield deployment on your NFV? You wanna answer that question? So or is it on the greenfield deployment? I would say that brown. Brownfield is a little far-fetched. Greenfield is the correct approach to go. Then bridge the gap between the brownfield and greenfield by having a migration plan. Right, so that was my question, right? So it, for that particular use case, uh, mm -hmm. was that a greenfield or was that a brownfield? It's a greenfield. Okay, got it. Brownfield is little. So what's your take on how to bridge the gaps? So bridging of the gap occurs through, because network is computing. Right. So it is through the SDN control programmability. That's the key. So we see going forward that SDN will be the key, even though NFV is the infrastructure with Mano and all that, but key is SDN, which is gluing all this. So to glue the underlay, the overlay, the old uh, way of doing things versus new way, all has to go through a SDN controller. So That's the key message. From a business point of view, if your physical infra is already completely appreciated, uh, why would I want to pay and do the greenfield on the uh, virtual environment? I understand going forward, it probably makes sense, but Correct. I wouldn't want to do away with my completely. So no, uh, no, nobody is asking you to do away. It's a question of when you do a park, you end up doing a selected segment or a slice. And then eventually when it establishes, now you say, hey, this doesn't go with my uh, infrastructure. How do I put together? So we do see that a slice, which is physical underlay, you will program through SDN controller directly. 
and so it could be existing or it could be new it doesn't matter to us right so sdn is the key programmability is the key for all these things how you go about it automation is another thank you thank you all right i think that's all we have we don't have any much more time thank you so much for coming and we'll be around if you have any more any more questions please feel free to come to us thank you